So let's look at the urinary system. Um, the urinary system is the major excretory system in the body. But it's not the only one. We excrete with the digestive system, we excrete with lungs, we excrete with skin. But this is the one we're going to have the most control over. So it is the major excretory system in the body. Well, what is excretion? Excretion is when you get rid of something. So we're going to try to get rid of something. And what we're getting rid of is basically waste products. Waste products build up because of metabolism, and waste products tend to be toxic, at least at higher levels. And so we're going to get them out. We're going to take them out of our body and put them into the environment. We're going to get rid of them. Again, all of these things do that, but the one we have the most control over and the one that's the most important is the urinary system. Well, if you look at the structure of the urinary system, it's actually pretty simple. There's two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra. It looks like this. So two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra. And that's basically all there is to it. But even though it's simple, it's an extremely, extremely important system. Because what the kidney does is it, it takes the blood and it removes the toxins, it removes the waste products, it removes any excess things that we have and we're going to get rid of it in our urine. And so the way it works is by filtering the blood. And actually it filters the entire blood supply about 66 times a day. So 66 times a day, your entire blood supply is filtered. And then whatever's wrong with it is fixed. So we're going to remove the waste products, remove the toxins, remove the, anything in excess. But that's not all that's going to happen. We're also going to adjust the volume. We're going to adjust the concentration of chemicals. And we're going to help adjust the pH. And then finally... We're going to balance how much water is in the body and how much salt is in the body. So if you look at what's going on here, it's important. It's important. And again, it's basically all about blood. So we're going to take blood, we're going to filter it, and then we're going to adjust all kinds of things about it. We're going to adjust the composition, we're going to adjust the volume. We're going to adjust how much salt is in it. We're going to remove the waste products. In other words, we're going to refresh this blood. And remember, it happens over and over and over all the time, 24 hours a day. And so in a 24-hour day period, we're going to do this 66 times. So, really, really important. A couple of other things that the kidneys can do, though, are kind of unique. One of those things is gluconeogenesis. So let's look at this word. Genesis means to create. And gluco refers to glucose. And neo means new. So in other words, the kidneys and the liver can make new glucose. It can create new glucose from non-glucose sources. In other words, it can just flat out create glucose. There are only two organs in your body that can do that are the kidneys and the liver, and that's it. No other tissues, no other cells can do that. Another thing was we just finished talking about respiration, and remember red blood cells, the number of them are controlled by the kidney. So remember the kidney's EPO, or erythropoietin. 
and that's what's going to increase numbers of red blood cells. And then finally, one last thing that the kidneys do is they assist in the production of vitamin D. Vitamin D is a three-step process. The first step happens in the skin. We talked about that in AMP1. Remember UV light in the skin, we're going to make vitamin D. But actually, we make what's called pro-vitamin D. And then that has to go to a couple other places. And one of the places it goes is to the kidney. And the kidney then helps us make vitamin D. Remember how important vitamin D is? Remember without vitamin D, children get rickets. And then without vitamin D, adults get osteomalacia. In other words, the bones are going to get really thin and rubbery and all that. So, kidneys have a bunch of different jobs, but the main job is all about blood. Again, removing toxins, removing excess ions, maintaining the amount of water and salt and acid and base, and then the volume and, and composition is constantly being adjusted. The other parts of the urinary system, we have these ureters, and the ureters are basically just tubes, and those tubes transport urine from the kidneys down to the bladder, and then the bladder is basically a storage organ. That's what it's all about. It's a storage organ for urine, and then finally there's a tube which carries the urine to the outside, and that's the urethra. So, again, if we look at it, it looks like this. So, two kidneys, two ureters, urinary bladder, and a urethra. Any questions about any of that? Okay, well, <clears throat> a couple of interesting things about kidneys. Remember when we talked about way back in AMP1, we talked about the membrane that's in here. Remember, we have a membrane around the heart. We have membranes around the lungs. Remember, those are serous membranes. Well, there's a membrane here, too. Remember, that's called the peritoneum. Well, most of the organs are in the peritoneal cavity. So if you look at the stomach, the intestines, the liver, they're inside this peritoneal cavity. But the kidneys are not. The kidneys are behind it. In other words, they're in what's called a retroperitoneal position. They're behind it. So they're not located in the peritoneal cavity. So if you do a cross-section through the abdomen, you can see here is the peritoneal cavity right here. So in here is where the stomach is located, and it's where the liver is located, and the pancreas, and all kinds of other organs. But look, the kidneys are not there. The kidneys are behind it. So here's a kidney. Here's a kidney. Again, it's called retroperitoneal. Retro means behind or backwards. Another thing about the kidney is they're not very strongly held in place. They're held in place by mostly adipose tissue. So if we look at them, there's a thick layer of adipose tissue right here. And that adipose tissue holds the kidneys in place. It also protects the kidney. Remember, adipose is very cushioning. Well, why is it important to have this cushion? If you look here, you can see that the left kidney is mostly protected by the ribs, but the right kidney hangs down lower because of the liver up here. 
and part of it hangs down below the lowest rib. And so if you get hit in the back, especially if you get hit on the right side, in the lumbar part of the back, you can damage the kidney. You can actually rupture the kidney. And so to keep that from happening, there's this thick layer of fat right here. Thick layer of fat that provides a cushion. And that's what this is right here, this thick layer of fat. It also anchors the kidneys and holds them against the wall of the um, abdomen. And so we have what's called this adipose capsule. It's a lot of adipose tissue that cushions the kidney and attaches it to the body wall. And then not only is there adipose, but there's dense connective tissue also. And so this is dense irregular, dense irregular connective tissue. Remember that has a lot of collagen, it's very tough. And that's called the renal fascia. It also helps anchor and hold in place the kidney. So that's where the kidneys are located. Well, let's look at a kidney individually. And let's look at what's inside the kidney. So if you look in here, it's pretty obvious that there are layers to the kidney. There's what's called a capsule. And the capsule, which is a sort of dark red, brown color, is mostly dense, irregular connective tissue. And so it gives the kidney its shape and it maintains it. But then there's a layer just inside the capsule, which is called the cortex. And then there's a deeper layer from that, which is called a medulla. And then in the very center of the kidney, it's hollow. And that hollow space is called the pelvis. The word pelvis means bowl is what it means. So it's like a bowl in here that's going to catch urine. And so we have the cortex. And if you look at the cortex, it's sort of lighter in color and it's grainy looking. And then inside there, we have the medulla. And if you look at the medulla, it's got light and then dark and then light and then dark. So you have that all the way around, light, dark, light, dark. So what we have are two different structures. The dark ones are called pyramids and the light ones are called columns. So if you look at this picture here, there's the dark, that's the pyramid, and there's the light, that's the column. And so look, it goes pyramid, column, pyramid, column, pyramid, column, all the way around. And then we have this hollow space, the renal pelvis. Again, that word means bowl. And so it's sort of a funnel shape uh, bowl, and it's going to catch the urine. And then it's going to pass it down to the ureters. So if we look at a real one, it looks a little bit different. But look, there's our capsule, dark red, dark brown color. Here is this cortex. And so this whole outer layer right here is the cortex. And if you look at it, it pretty much is the same color all the way around. And then here is the, the medulla. And so remember the medulla has two different structures in it. We have these darker colored pyramids and these lighter colored 
columns. So again, it goes pyramid, column, pyramid, column, pyramid, column, all the way around. So pyramid, column, pyramid, column, pyramid, column, all the way around. And then finally, we have this funnel shape, hollow space in here, and that is this pelvis. And that's where the urine is going to collect. So urine is going to come in here like this, and it's going to collect in there. And the urine then will enter the ureter and go down to the urinary bladder for storage. So here's a real one. So there you can see the cortex. There you can see the medulla. There's the pelvis. Okay, well, remember we have these hollow spaces right here. Well, the hollow spaces start out as small things. And look, this small thing is sort of wrapped around the pyramid. So these small things are called cups. And the Latin word for cup is calyx. So we have minor calyces, which are little cups, and they're wrapped around the pyramid. And so they're going to collect urine, which is coming out of the pyramid. And then what happens is these minor ones merge into a bigger one. The minor ones merge into a bigger one. A bigger one. And the bigger ones are called major calyces or big cups. And then finally, these major calyces join together to form a central hollow space, and that's the pelvis. Remember, pelvis means bowl. So what it does, it goes from little cup, big cup, bowl. So if you look at the pathway the urine takes, this is the pathway that it takes. First it goes minor calyx, major calyx, pelvis, down into the ureter, and then down into the urinary bladder. Finally into the ureters. Or urethra, sorry. Any questions? Okay, well, <clears throat> remember what the kidney is all about. The kidney is all about blood. So remember, 66 times a day, your entire blood supply is going to come to the kidney. It's going to be filtered, and then it's going to be cleaned up, refreshed, take stuff out, add stuff back. And then it's going to go back into the general circulation. Well, if you're going to do that, you got to have a lot of blood. So the artery that goes to the kidneys, the renal artery, is a very large artery. It's so big that about one-fifth of your blood goes through this artery. Two arteries goes through it and goes through the kidney, about one-fifth of the cardiac output. Remember, an average cardiac output is about five liters. So one-fifth of that, that means that about one liter per minute is going to your kidneys. So it's a big artery. And the artery branches right off of the aorta. So here's the abdominal aorta, and there's the renal arteries. So they're large. They have a very, very high blood pressure because they're right off of the aorta. Again, about one-fifth of your blood supply goes through here. So if we go back to this other picture, 
you can see just how large the renal artery is. Well, as soon as it gets in here, it's going to start dividing up. And then it's going to divide again and again and again and again. And so if you look at what the blood supply looks like, it looks like this. And so if we look at the arteries as it comes in, every time they divide, the name changes. Every time they divide, the name changes. So here is the pathway. So from the aorta, we go to the renal artery. And then the renal artery is going to divide. And then we get the segmental arteries. And then they're going to divide. And then we get interlobar. And then arcuate. And then this part is microscopic. We're not going to be able to see this unless we use a microscope. And so then the blood's going to come back out. So it comes back out first of these veins, and then these veins, and then these veins, and then finally back out into the general circulation. So let's look at that. So here's our renal artery. And then again, as soon as it divides, we're going to get segmental arteries. Segmental arteries go to an individual lobe of the kidney. And then as soon as they divide, we're going to get these arteries. And these are called interlobar arteries. So they're between lobes of the arteries. And look, they fan out like this. They fan out and they run up the columns. So here's a column right here. They run up the columns. So those are interlobar arteries. And then they're going to divide again. And now these arteries are going to make a curve like this. That curve is sort of arc shaped. And so these are called arcuate arteries, arcuate. So we had renal and then segmental and then interlobar and now arcuate. And then if you look at this, there are little arteries that stick off of here. These little arteries are called either interlobar arteries, sorry, interlobular arteries, or they're also called cortical radiate arteries. And then we're going to come back with blood vessels, with veins. So the first veins are these. And these are cortical radial veins or interlobular veins. And then look, we're going to get these that make a curve. So we're going to have the arcuate veins. And then we're going to have these, which run down the columns, right beside the interlobar arteries. And so they're called interlobar veins. And then they're going to enter this big vein, which is the renal vein. So again, if we look at it, it goes renal, segmental, interlobar, arcuate, and either the interlobular or cortical radiate. And then we can't see this part. It's mycopic. And then we go to interlobular veins or cortical radial. And then arcuate, interlobar, renal. Does that make sense? Any questions? This is not a very nice picture, but if you look at it on the PowerPoints, 
It's exactly that. It goes renal, segmental, low. Anyway, you, you can see it. So, renal, segmental, enter low bar, arcuate, enter lobular. And then veins, interlobular, arcuate, interlobar, renal. There are no segmental veins. Same thing here. Any questions? Okay. Well, remember when we looked at this, we said that this part right here was microscopic. We can't see it with our naked eye, but if you use a microscope, you can see this part. What we get when we get here are these little tiny structures that look like this. They're called nephrons. And a nephron is the functional units of the kidney. In other words, they're the ones that do what the kidney does. So they're the ones that are going to filter the blood. They're going to take out stuff, add stuff, adjust the concentration, adjust the volume, adjust the pH. And then what we're going to produce is urine. So they're going to make urine. And then that urine is going to be excreted. So it starts with blood vessels. So remember we said first it's seg uh, renal, then segmental, then interlobar. The interlobars run up the columns. Well, here is where the interlobars run. And then remember there are these that curve like this. Well, this is the one that curves right here. This is the arcuate artery. And then we have these little that stuck up like this. Remember, they're either called interlobular or cortical radial arteries. That's what this is. That's the interlobular or cortical radial artery. All of that we can see with our naked eye. But coming off of the cortical radial artery, the interlobular artery, is this. And that's an arteriole, the afferent arteriole. It does is it leads to a bunch of blood vessels and the blood vessels their capillaries are in a ball and the word for ball is glomerulus or glomerular so these are the glomerular capillaries so we have the afferent arteriole and the glomerular capillaries. And then coming away from the capillaries is another arteriole, the efferent arteriole. And then we go to another set of capillaries. These are called peritubular capillaries. Peritubular.
And from there, we go back into the, the Venus system. So that is the nephron, or at least part of the nephron. So again, nephrons are the structural and functional units. They're going to do what the kidneys do. And we're going to have this little ball, this little tuft of capillaries. And there it is right there. That's that little ball, little tuft of capillaries. There's what they look like, little balls of capillaries. Look a little bit like little tiny brains. But look how many of them there are. There's about one million of these things in each kidney. So there's a ton of them. Well, when you look at the ball of capillaries, that's what it looks like. So there's our afferent arteriole, and there's a ball of capillaries, the glomerular capillaries. And then here's our efferent arteriole. So if we go back to our original picture, here's our afferent arteriole, the ball of capillaries, and our efferent arteriole. Well, look, it has something around it. It has this, and that is called Bowman's or the glomerular capsule. And so what it does is it surrounds this ball of capillaries. So here's that Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule. And look, it surrounds these capillaries. So what's going to happen is blood's going to come in here. Remember, capillaries are leaky and fluid is going to be pushed out. Well, where it's going to go, it's going to go inside this Bowman's capsule. But remember, capillaries won't let red blood cells come out. The holes are too small. And so the rest of the blood is just going to go back into the circulation. So if we go back to our original picture again, there is Bowman's capsule. And so the fluid that gets pushed out here is going to enter this long tube. So let's look at Bowman's capsule. So here's Bowman's capsule. It has two layers to it. One layer is out here. Look, it makes this, this cup out here. That's called the parietal layer. So remember, parietal means it's not touching the organ. Here's our organ right here. It's not touching. And the parietal layer is simple squamous epithelium. Remember, they look like fried eggs. Look at them, and they're very, very thin. There they are, simple squamous epithelium. But there's another layer, and that other layer surrounds the capillaries. So look, it's this. It surrounds the capillaries. It's wrapped around them like this. Well, if you look at the cells that are this, they don't look like simple squamous cells. They look sort of like this. They have little finger-like projections or little sort of feet. The feet are called pedicels, and the cell is called a podocyte. So look, these are podocytes. So you can see them here. So 
if we look at the podocyte, there it is, and here's those little feet, the little pedicels. And if you take your hand and you do your hand like this, and you take your other hand and you do your hand like this, And then you interlock your fingers so that they're like this. Your fingers are interlocked. That's exactly what these little feet do. They interlock their little hands, their little feet together. So when you look at it, they look like this. So there's a podocyte. And there's the little pedicels. And look, they're interlocked, like interlocking your fingers. Well, they don't interlock so much that there's not little spaces between them. Just like your fingers would let water go through that's what happens here. Fluid goes through this space. These are called filtration slits. So fluid goes through the space into Bowman's capsule. And then that fluid is going to go through this tube. Well, the tube, if you look at it, is a long tube. So here's Bowman's capsule right here, sort of like a cup. Motion detected at the front door. Sorry about that. And then there's a long tube. I guess you can hear my dogs. But anyway, so there's this long tube. It's not straight like that tube. The first part of it is all twisted like this. The second part of it looks like a hairpin, sort of. And the third part is all twisted again. So the tube, if we stretched it out, it would look like that. But that's not really what it looks like. It looks like this. And it's divided up into three sections. So the first section, which is this part right here, is the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal because it's close to Bowman's capsule, convoluted because it's twisted, and then tubule. And then the second part is this part right here that looks like a hairpin. That's called the loop of Henley. And then the third part, here is the distal convoluted tubule. So if we look at it, here's the Bowman's capsule. There's the first part. That's the proximal convoluted tubule. Here's that little hairpin-like thing. That's the loop of Henley. And here's another. That's the distal convoluted tubule. So <clears throat> again, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henley, distal convoluted tubule. So let's look at each part. If you look at the proximal convoluted tubule, it's simple cuboidal cells. And those simple cuboidal cells are not just squares like this. The tops of them are ruffled like crazy. In other words, the membrane is not smooth and flat. It has these tiny little finger-like projections. They're called microvilli. And the reason we have microvilli is to increase the surface area. So we have tons of these microvilli. They also have tons of mitochondria in here. Remember mitochondria where we make ATP. So they're very active cells. And what they're active at is reabsorbing water and solutes. And so if we look at these cells, this is what they look like. So look, they're cuboidal cells. 
and they have these tons and tons of microvilli and then lots and lots and lots of mitochondria. So that's the proximal convoluted tubule, this part right here. The next part, remember, is this thing that looks like a hairpin. It's called the loop of Henle. Well, if you look at the loop of Henle, here's the loop of Henle right here. It has two segments to it, or two limbs. The fluid is going through here. It's going this way. It's going down. So that's called the descending limb. But when you get here, it turns around and comes back up. So that's the ascending limb. The two limbs don't look alike. So the descending limb is thin, thin. And here's what those cells look like. They're simple squamous epithelium. But when you turn around and you go back up, it gets thick. And so the thick segment looks like more like this. It's simple cuboidal epithelium. And then is the distal convoluted tubule. So if you look at the distal convoluted tubule, they're cuboidal cells, just like these up here the proximal, except they don't have hardly any microvilli. They have very few microvilli. So when you look at them, they look like this. So look how many microvilli there are in the proximal convoluted tubule, but how few there are here. And then finally, the very last part is called the collecting duct or collecting tubules. And if you look at those, they have two types of cells. They have these cells, which have no microvilli, and these cells, which do have microvilli. So if we look at that whole thing, Again, two types. With microvilli, they're called intercalated cells. And without microvilli, they're called principal cells. So these are the... Well, that's not a good picture. Let's go back to the other one. These are the principal cells. And these are the intercalated cells. Any questions? So, quick review if you look at this, the whole thing's called a, a nephron. And if you look at the nephron, it's divided up. First, we have the blood vessels. Remember, there's the afferent arteriole, the glomerular capillaries, and the efferent arteriole. And then we have the tube itself. And so we have Bowman's capsule, which has two layers. There's what the parietal layer looks like. There's what the visceral layer looks like. Remember, these are called podocytes. And they have feet. And they interlock those feet, and you create these filtration slits. And then here's our proximal convoluted tubule. The cells look like this with lots of microvilli and lots of mitochondria. And then we have the loop of Henle, two limbs, a descending limb and then an ascending limb. Descending limb looks like this. Ascending limb looks more like that. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule. In the distal convoluted tubule, the cells look like this. And look, they have very few microvilli. Very, very few. And then finally, we have the collecting duct or collecting tubule, which has two types of cells. We have these principal cells and these intercalated cells. Principal cells have no microvilli, 
Intercalated cells do have microvilli. Any questions? Motion detected at the front door. Okay, so remember the whole point of having these nephrons is to filter the blood, take the uh, bad stuff out. Well, that happens in three steps. It's called urine formation. And urine formation happens in three steps, filtration and reabsorption and then secretion. So when you look at these nephrons, they have these different parts, but we actually have two types of nephrons. They're exactly the same except for the length of the loop of Henle. They're also positioned differently. These are higher up in the cortex and these are lower down, right at the junction between the cortex and the medulla. And so if you look at them, again, there are two types. One type is cortical nephrons. So cortical nephrons are short. They have short loops of Henle. In humans, anyway, most of our nephrons are cortical, about 85%. The other ones are juxtamedullary. Juxta means next to. And medullary refers to the medulla. They're next to the medulla. So they're right at the junction of the cortex and the medulla. And they have long loops of Henle. And the loops of Henle hang way down into the medulla. And so when you look at them, they're easy to tell apart. Here's a cortical nephron. Look how short that loop of Henle is. And there's a juxtamedullary nephron. Look how long that loop of Henle is. Again, these are higher up, but these are right on the border between the cortex and the medulla, right at the junction. Now, remember we have an afferent arterial, efferent arterial, and we have capillaries. These are the glomerular capillaries. But there's another set of capillaries, and these are called paratubular capillaries. So here are the paratubular capillaries out here. Now you also have them here. And then you have these capillaries here, which are called vasa recta. So we have paratubular capillaries and vasa recta. And then of course we have these capillaries, which are the glomerular capillaries. So glomerular capillaries. Well, if you look at the glomerular capillaries, remember they're in a ball. And there's a blood vessel that goes to the ball and a blood vessel that goes away. Well, if you think about what it's like in most of the body, this is an arteriole. That's what goes to the capillaries. But what goes away from the capillaries is a venue. But that's not true in the kidney. In other words, there's an arteriole on this side, but there's also an arteriole on the other side. So we have two arterioles. One of them, which is going toward, remember the word for toward, afferent, toward the glomerular capillaries. That's the afferent arteriole. The other one is going away, and remember the word for away is efferent. So that's the efferent arteriole. So if we look at this, here is the afferent arteriole right here. And here's the efferent arteriole right here. Here's the afferent arteriole right here. Here's the efferent arteriole right here. 
Makes sense. Any questions? So, afferent toward, efferent away. Well, remember when we talked about capillary dynamics? We said that there was an arterio here, and then we had a bunch of capillaries, and then we had a venule over here. Well, remember, arterioles have two layers. Venues also have two layers, but the layers are different. Remember in an arterio, we have the tunica media and the tunica interna. On a venue, we have the tunica externa and the tunica interna. So an arterio, remember, has smooth muscle. And remember, if you have smooth muscle, you can do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. But a venue has no or very little smooth muscle. And because you have no or very little smooth muscle, you cannot do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. But it's not like that here. Here we have the afferent arterio. And then we have the glomerular capillaries. And then we have an efferent arterio. Since they're both arterioles, they both have a tunica media. If you have a tunica media, remember it's got smooth muscle in it. So they can both do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And so they can regulate the pressure in here. And so the pressure is much higher than in regular capillaries. And that pressure is going to push against the wall and force fluid and solutes out. So that's what's happening in here. Fluid is being forced out of the blood into Bowman's capsule. And then we have another set of capillaries. That's the paratubular and vasorecta. These are low pressure capillaries. Because on one side, there's an arteriole, the afferent arteriole, but on the other side is a venue. So these are just like regular capillaries that you find in the body. So on one side, an arteriole, but on the other side is a venue. So these are low-pressure capillaries. So when we look at the two types of capillaries, they're different. These high pressure. So we're going to get a lot of leaking. But these and these are low pressure, very low. And so what we're going to get is instead of leaking is we're going to get absorption. Does it make sense? Any questions? So, what kind of capillary is this? Anybody know? What kind of capillary is this? Anybody know? This one is a cortical. This one's a juxtamedullary. But either way, they have all the exact same parts. They have this afferent arteriole and glomerular capillaries, and then the efferent arteriole, paratubular capillary, same thing over here. So if you had a picture or something that looked like this, you should be able to tell them apart, and you should be able to label these parts. 
Any questions? Okay, there's one more thing and then we're going to stop for today. There's also a part of the nephron that's all about regulation. And that part is right where the proximal convoluted tubule touches the distal, um, sorry, it's right where the, let's start over. We have this regulatory portion and it's right where the afferent arteriole touches the distal convoluted tubule. In other words, the afferent arteriole goes this way, and here's the capillary bed, and then here's our distal convoluted tubule. Then we have Bowman's capsule here, remember? Well, what it does is it curls around, and here's our distal convoluted tubule back here. So right here, where the two touch each other, is a special area right there where they touch each other. It's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Remember, juxta means next to. So it's right next to the glomerulus. And what it is, is it's an area of regulation. When you look at it, it looks like this. So here's our afferent arteriole right here. And so what happens is the afferent arteriole is there. There's the proximal, I mean the Bowman's capsule proximal convoluted tubule. But look, it's going to go over here, and then we're going to give a loop of Henle, and then what's going to happen is the distal convoluted tubule is going to come back. So that's the distal convoluted tubule right there. So right where the afferent arteriole touches this distal convoluted tubule, is where we're going to have this J, uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, sometimes it's called the JG apparatus. So what we see when we look at it, there's our afferent arteriole, and there's our distal convoluted tubule. There are two special types of cells here. So on the afferent arteriole, look, we have these cells. They're special muscle cells. They're bigger than normal, and they have granules in them. They're called JG cells. JG cells. And then we also have right here on the distal convoluted tubule, these cells. They're not like these others. These are simple cuboidal. These are simple columnar. Not only are they tall, but they're densely packed. They look like this. They're densely packed. These are called macula densa cells. So two types of cells that are important, the JG cells and the mascula densa cells. And so if we go back, there are two types of cells, JG cells, here they are. Remember, they're smooth muscle, but they're bigger than normal, and they have granules in them. The granules are of something called renin. So those are these cells right here. They contain renin. And then the other cells that are important are on the distal convoluted tubule. That's these macula densa cells. They're tall, densely packed cells. And when you look at them, they're these cells right here. Well, one thing that makes them special is that these both of these types of cells act like receptors. 
So they're going to detect something. So if we look at these first, these are mechanoreceptors. What they detect is blood pressure. They detect blood pressure. And the way they do it is by detecting the stretch on this vessel. So think about it. If the blood pressure is high, high, the walls are going to be stretched. So they're going to be stretched more. So if I increase the stretch, that means that the blood pressure is high. If I decrease the stretch, that means the blood pressure is low. So they're mechanoreceptors. They're mechanoreceptors. And they detect stretch. And that correlates with blood pressure. So they detect blood pressure. These other cells, these right here, are a different kind of receptor. They detect a chemical. So these are called chemoreceptors. And the chemicals they detect are sodium and chloride. So they're chemoreceptors. They detect sodium and chloride. Well, sodium has to do with osmotic pressure. So sometimes these are called osmoreceptors. But again, they detect sodium and chloride. So, oops, wrong direction. So these detect blood pressure. These detect sodium and chloride. Any questions? So that's the anatomy of the kidney. So first we looked at the gross anatomy of the kidney. And if you look at the gross, we have these layers. So we have the cortex, we have the medulla, we have the, the um, pelvis, and then we looked at the blood vessels. So remember, we're going to need big blood vessels because we need a lot of blood pressure. And as soon as it gets in, it begins to divide. And every time it divides, the name changes. So... If you look at the blood vessels that are in there, these are those blood vessels. And what these blood vessels right here are going to, they're going to those nephrons. So if we look again at the flow of blood, remember we said it goes from renal to segmental to interlobar to arcuate to cortical radial or interlobular. But then look where it goes. It goes to the afferent arteriole, the glomerular capillaries, <clears throat> the efferent arteriole, and then the peritubular capillaries and vasa recta. Remember, all of that's microscopic. That's our nephron. And then from there, it goes into the cortical radial or interlobular vein, arcuate, interlobar, renal, back out. And again, this doesn't look very good, but you can see this on the PowerPoint. 
and it has it step by step by step. So right here is where our nephrons are. And that's what this is right here. That's the nephron. And remember, we have about one million of these per kidney. And so if we look at them, remember they look like this. And there's three parts to this nephron. There's the blood vessels. There's this long tube. And then there's this special little place. It's not there, but a special little place right here that we get regulation. So if we look at blood vessels, it starts with this capillaries, and then we're going to get you can see here, here's where they are. Look at those blood vessels. So right here's where Bowman's capsules are going to be. If you look at it under a microscope, remember they look like that. Here they are. You can see just how many of them there are. So that's a Bowman's, I mean, a glomerular capsule. And then here's the beginning of the tube. And the tube, remember, is like a cup shape. And then there's a tube that's like this. And then a thing that looks like a hairpin. And then another thing that looks like this. And then finally a collecting duct. So you have the glomerular capsule, two layers. And then the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, which has two limbs, and then the distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting duct. And then finally, the last part of that, remember we have this regulatory portion. And the regulatory portion is right where these two things touch each other. The afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule. And it's got two sections, two different types of cells. And these detect blood pressure. And these detect sodium and chloride. Any questions? So that's where we're going to stop today. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.